If you want to support me on Patreon, click the element on the end screen. Fringe's alternate universe continues to be a source of endless fascination, even more than half a decade after the series ended its initial run. Besides the Zeppelins, environmental degradation, and living counterparts of fallen celebrities, one of the most interesting aspects of the alternate universe is its technology. I've of course made videos in the past about the tech in Fringe, which you can check out now, links in the description. The devices that Fringe agents and the public use in the alternate universe range from the conceptually sound to the rather fantastical. Regardless, such tech gives us a glimpse not at just what could be in our future, but what could have been in our past. What I want to focus on in this video is spaceflight. We see indications of the alternate universe's more developed space program at multiple points throughout the series, from the Challenger poster in Peter's bedroom, to the daily lunar flights available to the general public. In this video, I'll speculate about what could have led to such differences, as well as explore other hypothetical changes that aren't necessarily present on screen, but could exist in this alternate timeline. Going chronologically, the earliest differences likely emerge in the 1960s. It's not explicitly clear whether John F. Kennedy or Richard Nixon was in the White House during this period, although we know both served as president. Non-canon sources conflict on the presidential line of succession in the alternate universe, a topic which I plan to explore in a separate video. For now, though, I'll stick with the general trends in spaceflight that we observe and extrapolate from there. Speculation exists that a surviving John F. Kennedy could have inspired cooperation between NASA and the Soviet Union to land astronauts on the moon. Nikita Khrushchev's son even admits that his father was prepared to accept Kennedy's offer, which he had presented at the United Nations, for a joint mission. As interesting of an idea as this sounds, unfortunately, the likelihood of this happening, even in a universe as quirky as Fringe's parallel Earth, is quite low. Fundamentally, the space race was a component of the Cold War. It was just as much about military domination than it was about expanding humanity's scientific horizons. The Soviet Union participating in such an exercise would have done wonders for relations between the two superpowers, but it also would have defeated the purpose of the race in Space Race. Additionally, if Khrushchev is still ousted in the mid-1960s, there's no reason to think that the subsequent administration, headed by Alexei Kosygin and Leonid Brezhnev, would be just as receptive to the idea of a joint lunar mission. With this in mind, and taking into account that we still see the space shuttle in use during the 1980s, it seems reasonable to assume that the Apollo program in the alternate universe took a similar course to our timeline. Justifying the large budget for NASA and the Apollo program would continue to be a challenge for any administration. Although judging by the alternate universe's advanced technology, it's likely that higher government funding for R&D took place. Choosing to pursue the space shuttle over a Mars mission would have been seen as a necessary decision during the economically tumultuous 1970s, at least in the eyes of the U.S. government. The Challenger poster in Peter's bedroom actually tells us a lot about how the program unfolded in the alternate universe. With the Challenger's 11th mission dated June 28, 1984, this almost certainly indicates that the shuttle program began a couple years earlier than in our timeline. As a matter of fact, Columbia, the first orbital vehicle in the space shuttle program, was slated to launch in June 1979 before construction of the shuttle was delayed. According to an internal NASA document published in 1977, the first flight of Columbia was to take place in preparation for a service mission of the space station Skylab, whose orbit was deteriorating. The second orbital flight, scheduled for July 1979, was to boost Skylab into a higher orbit so the station could continue to be used. After it became clear that Columbia would not be ready in time to rendezvous with Skylab, the station was deorbited. Even if Columbia is still delivered to the launch readiness facility in March 1979, it could still be launched before the end of the year, surviving other delays that plagued it in our timeline. Launching Columbia on its maiden voyage in fall or winter of 1979 would allow it to launch multiple service missions before 1981, testing robotic maneuvering systems and deploying operational payloads, followed by satellites. Due to the construction schedule of Challenger, Columbia would remain the only operational shuttle for over a dozen flights before Challenger is launched in January 1983, three months before it lifted off in our history. Plans to launch Department of Defense payloads on Discovery from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California could also move forward in such a scenario, though this is just speculative. The space program having a major presence near Jacksonville, Florida is quite an interesting divergence from our reality, with the Jacksonville base appearing as a replacement for the Cape Canaveral Launch Center. 
In fact, Jacksonville was among the cities considered for relocation of the Manned Space Flight Center in 1961 before Houston was chosen. In the alternate universe, it seems Jacksonville was chosen for relocation of the Launch Operations Center as opposed to Merritt Island. It remains unclear whether the facility is named after Richard Nixon, John F. Kennedy, or somebody else. Housing a branch of Bishop Dynamic by 1985, the Jacksonville facility is also likely involved with the deployment of the Star Wars Missile Defense System, proposed by Ronald Reagan. I have an entire video dedicated to this concept, known formally as the Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI. In real life, critics of SDI levied that not only could it lead to destabilizing of relations with the Soviet Union, but many of its technologies, such as an X-ray powered laser, were scientifically out of reach. Not to mention, many elements of SDI would have violated various space treaties signed in prior decades. The alternate universe's more advanced technology appears to have helped NASA scientists make SDI reality under the direction of Dr. Walter Bishop, Reagan's national security czar. The space shuttle would have likely been used to deploy satellites equipped with anti-ballistic missile systems, which combined with ground-based interceptors would theoretically function as a deterrent to nuclear attacks. In real life, even the proposal of SDI was seen as a threat to the Soviet Union's stability, crippling confidence in the Soviet defense industry, and likely hastening the end of the Cold War. An SDI that was actually deployed may have forced the Soviet leadership to restructure the nation's economy, which may be how the USSR was preserved, as directly evidenced in the show. A surviving USSR would have significant effects both domestically and internationally. One potential outgrowth is a renewed interest in the space programs of both countries, with the U.S. Congress less reluctant to provide funds for NASA's modular space station design. As a result, the International Space Station, approved early during Bill Clinton's first term, is likely never built. Instead, the space station Freedom, first proposed by Ronald Reagan during a State of the Union address, begins construction by the late 1990s, with Mir-2 serving as the Soviet counterpart. In fact, the Zvezda module, which provides life support systems for the ISS, was originally designed for Mir-2. The fact that we see a travel poster for the USSR in Fringe is indicative that their rivalry with the US is more in the spirit of friendly competition than the prior Cold War attitude of evil empire. The US and USSR would compete in the realms of science and technology, sports, and other areas, while retaining a military rivalry as both superpowers would compete for control of the world's resources. A surviving USSR could also potentially benefit Afghanistan and other socialist governments, meaning Al-Qaeda would probably remain based in Sudan. By the 21st century, this new space race could have an influence on the ubiquity of advanced technologies in public venues, as well as in law enforcement. A newspaper clipping from the Fringe Season 2 press kit even indicates that a manned mission to Mars is currently in development at NASA. But what could have allowed daily flights to the moon becoming available to the public? Part of the reason is that, clearly, private spaceflight companies play a much larger role in the development of space than even in our world. While it isn't directly stated that the U.S. has a manned lunar base in the alternate universe, orbital lunar flights have been a staple of private space companies' efforts since the early 2000s. The company Space Adventures, founded in 1998, was established specifically with space tourism in mind, including a circumlunar flyby for which they currently charge $150 million per seat. Other companies such as Virgin Galactic and SpaceX have proposed similar tourism operations, slated for the early 2020s. Gladderflug, which also operates a commercial airline in the Prime Universe, would have to offer seats at a much cheaper price if they were to advertise outside public venues. How is this possible? It's a stretch, but making lunar flyby tours possible by 2010 would require immense reductions in launch costs, as well as better hardware to handle the launch and propulsion systems. For a universe with newspapers that have built-in video players, this doesn't seem too unreasonable. Preventing the Challenger disaster would have positive effects on launch costs, which rose after the shuttle was destroyed in our timeline. Combining this with increased competition in the private sector could yield a scenario where Elon Musk's goal of reducing launch costs by a factor of 10 is achieved. Even at $500 a pound, or $1,100 per kilogram, tickets for a lunar flyby would still cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, Perhaps not a problem if you're very rich, which could be Gladderflug's initial clientele, until costs begin to fall at a more natural rate. Either way, the possibilities presented by the tech in Fringe's alternate universe certainly elicit a sense of wonder, and make us think about what's possible in our world. Thank you all so much for watching this video. 
I hope that I've been able to illustrate how the space program in Fringe's alternate universe could have taken the form we see in the show. If you enjoy this, be sure to check out my other Fringe videos in which I explore other facets of the alternate universe, and be sure to check out my other content as well. If you want to support me on Patreon, click the element on the end screen. Don't forget to subscribe, and don't forget to be awesome.